Hey people, welcome to the Run Testers. Today we are going to be reviewing this. This is the Polar Vantage V2. It's £449 in the UK. It is $499 in the US. It has got a 40-hour GPS battery life extendable to 100 hours. It's got a load of new running skills, and we're going to tell you whether or not they stack up to that price tag. Is this good value for money or not? Should you be upgrading from a V1? Should you go for a Grit X? Should you not consider Polar at all and go for a Garmin 745 or something different? This review will tell you the answer to that question so here it is. So first up, let's talk about design. So the V2, it's lighter at 52 grams, so it's much lighter than the V1. It's got a kind of it's almost like a one-piece kind of um, carbon fiber aluminium case, and it basically looks a little bit slicker, a little bit sleeker. My personal opinion is that it's one of Polar's best-looking watches ever. But what what have you guys found about the change up in design that we've got on the V2? Uh I actually think it's quite small changes that have produced a massive improvement for me. Uh, I found it just, I, I, the look is fine. I like the look. I prefer the look to the grit, but it's not a huge thing for me. It's just how it feels on the wrist. It feels much slimmer, sits much closer to the wrist for me. Uh, it's more comfortable to wear the whole time. Generally, I, I, I think it's a massive improvement. Um, it's, I think I've liked it the most in terms of its kind of design more than any other watch I've tried from Polar. I think probably the buttons are better than the V1 as well. The screen's slightly less laggy. I still don't really like the touchscreen. I'd rather just use the buttons. But yeah, it is an improvement. And the ambient light sensor on the screen, I think, is also a big improvement. I think it is clearer when you're out on the run on kind of sunny days. The screen is kind of, there's never any problem reading the screen. I do think it's because it's automatically adjusting the brightness. So yeah, I actually think it's, yeah, it looked quite a small change on paper, but I think it's a big improvement uh, in terms of the design. And Mike, talk to us a little bit about the touchscreen and the buttons. Yeah, so the touchscreen display, um, so you're getting the same 1.2 inch screen um, on the V2 um, that you had on the Vantage V. Um, it's the same resolution. Now, the thing is with me with touchscreen displays, I think you either have to go all in um, or I think don't do it at all. And I think on sports watches, I don't think it's that useful. I don't use it that much. I think when I have used it, I think it's quite useful for notifications on smart watches, full smart watches, but... I think its application on the V2, like the V, um, is not great. And I think personally, as I said, I think either Polar have to kind of embrace it as a display technology or as a way of interacting or ditch it. And to be honest, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a massive fan of it on the V2. I mean, in terms of the design itself, you know, I think it's small changes, but really important changes. Talks about the buttons. The buttons just have a nicer feel um, to use uh, when you're interacting with. A lighter design, um, it's slimmer. Um, so yeah, a refined design, I think, of the V2. I quite like the um, the look of the Grit X, but I, I like the fact, you know, I think people are going to appreciate there's something a little bit different with the V2 and the Vantage kind of V-Ray. And there's a lot to like in the uh, new design. Yeah, I'd absolutely agree on the buttons. And I think the touchscreen, you're right, it's it's a little bit improved. But the other thing I think we should note is that the, the Vantage V2 is now 100 meters water resistant, whereas the original V was 50. So there's an improvement there as well. Okay, well, let's have a look at battery life. So battery life on paper, what you're getting with the V2 is a bigger battery. You're getting up to 40 hours in full GPS mode. That's extendable up to 100 hours in low power GPS mode. And on paper, you're supposed to be getting seven days of kind of general usage out of that. Now that puts it in line with the Polar Grit X. It's also makes the Polar V2 at this price bracket one of the best for battery life overall. But that's on paper. How did it stand up to your tests in practice? Mike, what did you find? Yeah, so battery life for me, um, you know, I kind of focused on, you know, using it in that full GPS mode and, you know, just generally what it's like to live and you know train with uh, throughout kind of a week um what i found is that the kind of drop off in battery life when you're tracking is not bad really it's pretty much in the norm of what i'd expect to what i've had with you know other sports watches it's that time in between where you see that uh, more of a drop off so i was probably getting five to six days you know not quite stretching to um to a week um and i think you know what i kind of put that down to all that massive kind of drop off in between um tracking i think uh, the kind of rich sleep tracking um support you get on the vantage v2 seems to have a noticeable impact on the battery life overnight battery life for me in the v2 not fantastic and i would just expect a bit more from you know polar's top end um sports watch nick it's interesting because you i think you come at some of these tests from a slightly different angle where you'll look at 
basically what you're going to get out of a week in terms of battery life for, for practical training, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What I want from a high-end watch is I want it to last a week of my training. So that's running uh, kind of five or six days. Um, and so it's about... Uh, it's about 50 miles of running there's a couple of support sessions in there i'd like you know when it's once you get into this kind of high end i want it to last a week which the grit did the grit x did actually after i reset uh, did a factory reset the battery life did start did mean it could last a week i haven't had that at all from the vantage v2 it's actually not lived up to its kind of on paper performance i've had four or five days max basically i'd get five days if i did it from the start of the week uh, but only four days if it included my kind of longer run at the end of the week like mike i found it was fine during activities it drained reasonably slowly although i'm not sure i'd get 40 hours out of it based on my testing i think it was draining at a faster rate than that um, but in between kind of runs it was draining very quickly to the point where actually I wore it side by side with the Garmin 745, uh, which only has 16 hours of GPS battery life, but that actually lasted me longer in terms of real world use because you know I'm only running kind of an hour a day, and in between runs the Garmin drained much more slowly, probably because it's sleep tracking for one isn't as detailed. But yeah, so I, I found the V2 slightly disappointing on the battery front. Four to five days isn't isn't really a nightmare, and I will say it charges really quickly. I found so again, it's not a huge problem. It's just I find when you're hitting these kind of you know, the top tier watches, you know, I just want it to last a week. And so I, I come at this from a slightly different angle where I'm kind of looking, I often do sort of big, longer sort of stints of running. So you're talking about ultras where you want to have that, you know, 10, 12 hours all out. And actually in my tests, I got around 25 hours training time in full GPS mode, which is kind of below the 40 hours that was stated. I got five days sort of general usage which kind of is, is close to what your experience was, Nick. But then in low power GPS mode, I think that was one where in my test I was most disappointed because it basically did, I got about 32 hours in low GPS mode and that's way, way below the 100 hours. And I would totally agree that it's also seemed to be a problem in between runs as well, where that, that all of those recovery features and the things that it's doing overnight to track your sleep seem to be a drain. So battery life for me was a little bit of a question mark. So into some of the other nitty gritty then, starting with heart rate accuracy, something that everybody wants to know about. The Vantage V2 basically has Polar's Precision Prime heart rate technology, which is supposed to have a skin contact sensor, along with those kind of LEDs that are supposed to help weed out any kind of, what they call kind of artifacts in your heart rate reading. So it's supposed to be able to spot when you've got bad contact and it will take those things out of your readings. How did it fare in your tests, Nick? basically okay but basically not good enough that's the problem um you, when you've got all this data going into all these kind of recovery features it, it really only takes one bad run in terms of heart rate accuracy to skew you for a week or even a month of kind of you know your recovery advice so i did a couple of runs and broadly it was okay at a steady pace uh, if i did intervals it would either lag behind uh, kind of a chest straps reading or miss miss the spike completely also sometimes spiked at the start of a run so again like uh, you know it's not a problem you could still use it to kind of guide your runs but you are going to occasionally get one really bad run i found and that will skew all your readings so i put a chest strap on pretty quickly because if you're buying this watch you want that recovery advice to be and training and training analysis to be accurate and so if you if you really i think one thing we'll come to will advise with this is that you should probably buy the package that comes with the h10 chest strap which is 40 pounds more it's for 189 pounds in the uk as opposed to the 449 mike did you did you find that as well in terms of your experience yeah so i think Quite similar to Nick um, in terms of what I got from the um, kind of heart rate um, kind of performance um, on the Vantage V2. Um, what I would say, you know, I think what Polar is doing in this space in terms of improving that accuracy from the uh, from the wrist, they're making you know major strides in that point of view. But yeah, I think a lot of you know it was quite quickly I could kind of see that I needed to kind of grab a chest strap for. Um, for most of my runs, I think like steady runs, it was generally fine. It was kind of what I expect, you know, I had it against a, a Garmin HRM Pro chest strap and, you know, the, the differences were, you know, what I would expect to see or, you know, very consistent. Um, there was just a few runs when I went out quicker, maybe doing some interval stuff or just going out and do some kind of nice quick runs um, that, you know, either the heart rate was maybe a little bit low uh, to start off with, um, had some kind of very random spikes, but yeah, ultimately, I would say pay extra for the chest strap if you don't already have one that works with the uh, VT. Yeah, something I have totally felt, I actually did one test, I did a trail marathon along the coast. There were lots of kind of um, dips and lots of hills in there. So the intensity changed between sort of running along the tops of cliffs then dropping down and rising up. And the V2 really kind of struggled. My overall max on the, the V2 was like 185 uh, BPM versus 165 on the H10. 
It also tended to spike at times when the H10 didn't. Uh, interestingly, I also did the running performance test that comes with this watch, which is a kind of more gradual run where you sort of slowly increase your intensity um, over a 20 minute period. And it, it managed much better with that slow increase of pace. And it was very, very close to the H10 on that. So I had a bit of a mixed performance as well. So another thing obviously people like to focus on is GPS accuracy. How did this stack up in the test that you did, Nick? Broadly, pretty good. Yeah, I think it's within the margin of error, uh, certainly in all the runs I did. I found it would read slightly longer than other watches. I have a measured loop near me, which is a, uh, a 2.475k loop. How do you know it's that distance? Because <laughs> I got a measuring wheel out and I did it. <laughs> right now, you know, you don't have access to things like tracks. So I want real accuracy on the places near me and I measured it out properly and the Polo tended to read very slightly long, but not really a problem and basically for me GPS actually a lot of it comes down to I use lap pace when I'm doing kind of progression runs tempo runs even kind of interval interval pace so that's the most important measure you know where GPS actually really comes into play uh, and I found it, it was pretty good you know occasionally you see a lap where it would the lap pace would rise or fall really dramatically for no real reason but usually it would even out by the end of like a kilometer broadly the GPS actually is absolutely fine as good as other watches I test really I, I personally found that it was it was solid in full power mode but again, you know, my use case when I want to use that low GPS accuracy for longer, longer runs in that trail marathon test that I did, it didn't really perform very well at all. It came up about seven miles short up against the Garmin Phoenix 6 in full power mode. Basically, you you know, when you talk about that distance, you don't expect low power mode to be 100% accurate. And over ultra distances, it doesn't tend to sort of matter too much to be a mile here or there. But when you're talking about six miles and you think you've, you think you've run six more miles than you have along a coast, it's very disheartening <laughs> to realise that you haven't. And Mike, what what was your what was your experience? Yeah, so GPS was um, was good for me. What I would kind of expect from a high end um, sports watch. Um, I was running with it against the nine four uh, four nine four five, the um, Phoenix Six um, Pro, and you know I think the first thing for me, I you know I don't like to be hanging out waiting for a GPS signal, and I kind of used it in quite open spaces. I used it in kind of busier spaces and there's no real kind of you know keeping me hanging around waiting for that signal and in terms of the the data you know on the longer runs and on the kind of shorter runs i didn't have any you know major cause of concern which you know didn't really skew the other kind of metrics that i was tracking which were kind of in line um with the other watches that i was comparing again so for me gps uh very good i say i only really use the um kind of in full gps mode which is what i would normally do anyway um and yeah, in terms of what the V2 kind of delivered, um, I think better than uh, what I got from the Vantage V in the kind of my earlier testing on that watch, uh, which kind of improved over time. But with the V2, um, yeah, no real major issues for me on the uh, GPS front. So now we get into the really interesting stuff, the running performance and the features that Polar has on this watch. Now it's worth saying that this is, this is Polar's most fully featured watch yet you're getting everything that we saw kind of launched on the grit x some of the new skills that came with that watch and from things like the ignite plus all of the old skills that came with the original v all into one package on the v2 so this is where you'll get all of the features that polar offers and some new skills too so things like you're going to get cardio load muscle load running power you'll get running index you'll get fit spot workout recommendations you're going to get sleep stages plus you're going to get the nightly recharge feature and the Recovery Pro feature that uses the chest strap and the orthostatic test. You're gonna get fuel-wise fueling recommendations. You're also gonna get hill splitter. On top of that though, and where we'll start here with the really interesting features, there are two new features unique to this watch. One of them is the running performance test, and then there is a leg recovery test. So let's kick off with the running performance test. Nick, can you just talk us briefly through what this test entails? Sure. Basically, you kind of you get it going. Uh, you do a warm up, um, and then once you once you into the actual test itself, the watch is basically showing you two stats. It shows your heart rate and the pace it wants you to hit the current pace, and this will ramp up from a very slow pace, um, kind of about sixteen minute miling, I think it is, um, and it will just keep going and going and going until you hit kind of your max there's two options you can do a sub maximal test or i think it top basically the test ends once you hit 85 percent of your maximum heart rate or you can do the full out maximum test run until you basically cannot hit the pace anymore and if you do that it will spew out a whole load of really useful numbers things like uh what it reckons your threshold pace is basically numbers that you can then put into practice in your training um to kind of guide your sessions 
those numbers can be then automatically calibrated so it will set your other zones on the watch for you to guide your future training if you want to you don't have to it's optional and how, how did you find it in practice then nick following the test uh incredibly frustrating if i'm honest um <laughs> basically i had a kind of little concern about it as soon as i saw it you was using instant pace reading based on gps oh, i kind of anyone who's run with gps watches a lot will know that's slightly dicey that's why i use lap pace because instant pace isn't going to be that accurate but you know i put that to the side i set aside a kind of a special day to go and do this test did my warm-up First time I failed the test, it was because I couldn't go slow enough for the early paces because it was too slow, but that's that's my fault. Second time I failed the test is the watch's fault, basically. Um, I was hitting the pace, kind of going up. You get like quite a big margin for error. So if, you know, if you're not going at the you know required pace, the watch will tell you, and then you have a chance to kind of get back into the right zone before it will kind of cancel the test. Um, but once I hit kind of 3.20 per K pace, I could see it was jumping around a lot. I got to 3.10 per K pace, which is my 5K pace. And I could see the watch was just going 2.30 per K, you know, 4 minute per K, 2.45 per K. It was never running at the right. And I was running steadily on along a long straight road I picked specially for this test. And eventually the test failed and I hadn't hit 85% of my heart rate. So I got no readings at all. And I just don't know where I could go to do this test. Uh, even on track, GPS watches tend not to be that accurate. Um, and yeah, I didn't do it again because like, you know, it's a lot of time out of my day to go and do this exact test. I had to, you know, change my training regime that week to kind of fit it in. And I didn't get the results and I don't think it will be accurate enough using GPS. So I think that's really interesting because you're, you're on a very, very tight schedule of training to, to achieve a very specific goal. And there aren't windows to mess with that. You know, and this is a, this is a run that basically will break you essentially, you know, and it's so you're not, you know, you have to be very careful about when you plug that into your training. I, when I ran with it, I, I kind of had some of the same experiences where I felt like it was so, I was so intent on what was going on in the watch. I was watching the watch all the time, trying to stay within that pace that wasn't easy to do. And I found it somewhat distracting, particularly, you know, I've done proper in-lab VO2 max tests when you're on a treadmill and you have these, you know, it gets very hard to concentrate on. And the, the main thing that you're focusing on is just busting those lungs as hard as you can. And you need almost to have all that mental energy to be able to really push through. And when you're trying to do this sort of concentrating on whether or not I'm hitting the right pace and running the right pace at the same, same time, I found sort of somewhat, it ran, you know, it was, it was confusing and a little bit difficult to do. I also had one initial failure. Luckily, I hadn't gone that far into the test and I was able to kind of restart. But again, you know, even if you've only done five minutes of this test, you're not going in fresh and that could skew the results. So the GPS accuracy is absolutely essential. I... I, I kind of felt like I want to have something like this. I think they're in the in the right ballpark, but I'd almost like to be able to do a protocol that takes me into a treadmill, run it on the watch somehow, or use that kind of treadmill hookup, something like that. You know, the Apple Watch could probably do this better because it speaks to some treadmills, but you've got that more consistent sort of situation in which to run. You've got a consistent speed. Uh, the increments maybe for me would have been more interesting also to, if you've if the idea really is to build by heart rate intensity actually, and that's one of the key figures you need, it would have been better to do that by heart rate rather than pace. So you could use the heart rate as the guiding figure, the watch is still clocking your pace, and you can still use that to calibrate, which is interesting they haven't done that. But I did, f I wanted to love this test and I wanted to be able to use it. I love the idea of being able to benchmark every month and come back and see progress, have it calibrate a lot of the settings on the watch to be more accurate, but it just didn't feel like it was quite there. And then the other test, the second new test is a leg recovery test. So it's a protocol that is used and it's an adaptation of that, which is tracked by the watch. It's quite a simple test to perform. You essentially do three jumps. It, it clocks how high you jump in each of those sets of benchmark. And then each time, you know, you can come back periodically. You could do it kind of week to week, or you can come back after you've done particularly hard, intense sessions if you want to work out whether or not you're muscles have recovered as well as your cardio system so things like the cardio load um, tools on watches they're looking at your cardiovascular system this the idea is to give you a window into your muscular recovery as well how did how did you guys find it mike did you use that yeah so i did use the uh, the um the jump jump test which i think is really interesting especially when you know we've talked about how many of the kind of analysis and training features are driven by heart rate and if you don't have a chest strap or you know you don't use it i mean you should use it um you know the accuracy on the heart rate monitor pu pushing the data to influence those uh, insights is going to be a problem so if you can kind of look at 
a little bit more physically in terms of how well recovered you are from runs or how how well optimized you are in terms of going out and for going out and doing a you know a big kind of powerful training run um i really like the idea of this feature the only thing for me is i wasn't really sure about the kind uh, you know the, the exact jump technique or you know what you kind of really need to do and i think you know, there's a bit of instruction on the watch uh, but i think they could do a little bit more i think you know to make sure that you're doing it consistently and you're getting ultimately like you know the most valuable um, kind of insight i was really excited about this test i went way you know i was really focused the first time i did the jumps and i was really going for it jumped way too like well not way too high. i jumped really high then i was just doing it as part of my normal training i was just doing it quite quickly three jumps and actually my results were skewed by that first jump so really do the jumps like you're going to keep doing them don't you know the first day feel really excited you know push to try and hit the ceiling just jump normally i love this test i think it's a very good idea to have a very quick easy test that's so simple to fit into your day i do i'll do it while boiling the kettle that kind of thing and i think it's completely opposite of the running test in that it's quick simple fits into your training gives you a very quick easy result that has actual relevance full marks to polar for this little feature i think it's a really clever little idea to add to a watch so let's let's dive into some of the other features nick there were some other things that you found particularly valuable that come with the polar vantage v2 so one thing I really, really like to add to this watch, it is just a small thing, is the um, kind of weekly training view watch face you get on the uh, on the watch, which basically just has your t the time there and then a ring around the outside shows how much time you spent in each heart rate zone, plus kind of your total training time in hours. I think it's, again, a very nice, clever idea that gives you a very clear snapshot of your training. You can just see, like, oh, look, I've spent a lot of time in zones one, two, and three. That's how it should be. You know, I'm kind of balancing my training, lots of kind of easy, steady running. A little bit around here is red and orange, where I did my sessions, my intervals, maybe a tempo run. And I can see at a glance that my training load is balanced. And Mike, a feature that you liked and maybe something that you didn't? Yes, I think the couple of features that I think kind of stand out for me, one that's new for the... Um, V2 is um, fuel wise, which was on the Gritex, and you know as I you know I'm starting to kind of pick up those kind of bigger miles and those train you know those kind of training and fueling. And you know, my fueling is, is generally pretty good, um, but you know I like the idea that you can be a bit smarter about that. And it's something I do worry about um, in runs and in races. So you know the fact that um, you've got something like this on the V2, which I think I really liked on the Gritex, I think is a real um, massive plus. And um, Another one that's kind of been around, Fitspark, I think, you know, I've been using um, kind of in comparison uh, Garmin's kind of uh, suggested workouts, um, which are all kind of, you know, running based um, workout suggestions. Whereas with the um, with Fitspark, it's, you know, looking at stuff when you're not running. And I quite like how it, how that kind of looks at your data, looks at what you've you've tracked. And that kind of dictates those kind of sessions that you should be doing. So those are a couple of things that I kind of really like. The music features, I mean, are pretty basic. If you if you like um, the kind of music control and music play and you know the way it's done on other what uh, you know that other watches have. But I think for me, fuel wise you picked up there, Mike is one of them. So this idea that it will tell you based on your the length of your run, the intensity you intend to run at, you know, what you should eat and when. So you can sort of, A, use it to prep the fuel that you would carry, particularly on an ultra, which is something which I find difficult, even having a lot of experience, is working out, you know, how many bundles of 20 grams of carbohydrate do I need to whack in my bag? Fuel-wise, you whack in those details and it will tell you what you need to take with you in your pack. Really handy. And then actually that kind of that adjusting it as you run is, is a fantastic tool. And even just the nudging, you know, the fact that it nudges you and says, have you eaten? I definitely found that fuel-wise, would help me to eat when sometimes I probably wouldn't have eaten. And that gave me a very, very even approach to my fueling on runs. It's, it's, it's helped me no end in that front. So I think fuel wise is a really valuable feature here if you're someone who goes longer and ultra marathons and beyond. I, I definitely agree on that. Um, I think fuel wise actually is one of the most exciting new features out in 2020. And I'm really pleased it's out in the V2 as well. Uh, I think kind of the new other new features that were introduced kind of with the Grit X that have made it here as well probably aren't quite as exciting and don't do quite as good job. The navigation is, is fine. It's break crumb trail navigation with turn by turn through Kamut. Uh, I think it's good, but you get the similar experience from 300 pound watches like the Chorus Apex or the Forerunner 245. And Hill Spitter, I don't know, we're not all huge fans. I find it's just not very accurate and not very practical in how it's actually implemented in terms of the stats it shows. I don't know how you guys find it. Yeah, I mean, I found it. So sometimes it didn't pick up a hill that I was running until I was halfway up it, particularly if you were doing sort of shorter hill sprints, so something you'd build into your kind of marathon training. 
it, it was obviously a little bit easier if you were doing ultras where you were on a hill that you'd be going up for an hour it didn't sort of make that much difference but yeah it just seemed it just didn't seem quite complete in terms of the stats that you were going to get it wasn't ne didn't necessarily have all the useful information and wasn't as reliable as, as i would have liked i guess one problem they have there is it's going to get compared to garmin's climb pro which obviously does use a route you, you've got to put a route in beforehand whereas with um polis hill splitter it's automatically tracking hills but climb pro will show you how much elevation you have left in your run it will analyze each climb you're on and tell you how much you have left just you know again which is you know, a generally kind of more it's kind of more proactive tool, I guess, is the way you say it. Like you can see, oh, I need to not go, you know, hell for leather on this hill because one mile down the line, I've got an even bigger one coming, that kind of thing. It's just all very kind of clever and useful information. So that all important verdict and I'll kick off. So I love the fact that it's lighter, it's sleeker. I think it looks great. I think the, the buttons are a massive improvement. I think the fact the touchscreen is a little bit more responsive is nice, although that isn't really a, a deal breaker. Uh, the battery life for me wasn't, up to scratch as much as I sort of found on something like the Grit X. But for the way that I run, and the fact that I love having this kind of full rounded sort of package of features that cover everything from your moment of performance when you're running right through to sleep recovery, and you've got Recovery Pro in there with a sort of really accurate kind of heart, heart rate variability test, fuel-wise fueling recommendations for going ultra, all of those things I think make this a really, really interesting watch. It's a toss-up for me between the Grit X and the Polar Vantage V2. I think if, you, if you're not bothered about Recovery Pro, you don't care about having music controls, and you know, there's an argument to say that for £70 cheaper, you could go for the Grit X, but I think if money was no object and I had a choice to make, I personally would be going V2. Mike, what was your, what's your verdict on the watch? and would you opt for it over some of the others? Yeah, so verdict for me on the V2, I think there's, you know, there's enough, you know, from my experience of the Vantage V, I think there's enough going on in terms of improvements and the design, the hardware, um, the features to make the V2 um, a worthwhile kind of upgrade. Now, if I was picking um, from the kind of top-end Polar watches that are available now, I would personally go for the Gritex. I don't mind the design, you know, quite quite like it. Um, I think all the kind of key features that I would want um, there that Polar are kind of working on at the moment um, is in the grid tech, things like FuelWise, um, FitzBark, um, that kind of little bit extra battery life that you're probably going to get. Um, I think for most runners and for, for me personally as a runner, I think the grid X would probably serve me well and it you know, costs less money as well. So, yeah, so I think um, if you're upgrading from the... Thinking about going from the V to the V2, I think there's an argument to, to do it. I think, personally, if I had the choice, I would go for the uh, Grit X. Nick, what about you? Are you are you V2 or Grit X? So I'm V2. Like, uh, I, um, and, and to be honest, it's not like it's, this is a heart over head choice, probably, because I'm not going to use the extra features really that much, that the ones that are on the V2 compared to Grit X. I just find the user experience on the V2 so much nicer. I think it's a much nicer watch to wear. It looks nicer. It feels nicer. That ambient light sensor makes it clearer. I think it's better, even though the battery life is a little bit worse than the Grit X, I, you know, the extra features probably aren't worth the money for me, but I just like using it so much more, it would be my pick. It's it's probably the Polar I've liked most since the M430 in terms of just day-to-day -day use. I used it as my kind of main watch for kind of five, six weeks and was really happy doing so. Um, I just, whereas the Grit X, I just didn't like the design, the kind of bulk of it, um, even though it's still very light. Yeah, I just didn't enjoy using it as much um, and it's not always an objective thing, is it, when you're picking a running watch? For, for me, there's one, there's one really interesting thing that we're talking about this, is that there's a big question about whether or not the Grit X and the Polar Vantage V2 both needed to exist. And then, Nick, talk, talk us through some of the comparisons here without watches outside from other brands. How does it stack up against things like the 745 for Garmin? Yeah, so I think uh, this is really where, um, you know, the big, the big questions come like um is uh how does it compare to the kind of top end garments i think i think it, we could probably clearly say straight away that the polar is better than the kind of top end coros watches the vertex which is over 500 pounds which is an amazing in terms of battery life and build but in terms of kind of software side of things polar is kind of streets ahead in terms of training analysis it's much tighter with garmin um and i think for a lot of people it might come down to the kind of runner you are like the 745 is obviously pitched at the same price kind of the big difference is here the 745 has that really short gps battery life for 16 hours it is not pitched as a kind of ultra watch and outdoors watch it's really aimed at kind of road runners. It's got a very small design that sits very nicely on the wrist if you do want a smaller watch, but you are paying for it in terms of battery life. It just does do things like advanced training analysis and suggested workouts, but you're not getting fuel wise. Um, and it also 
I should say the 745 also has breadcrumb navigation, but not the maps you get on the 945 and the Phoenix. But you won't have polars fuel wise. You won't get polars kind of sleep tracking, which is as good as anything out there. Um, so really, it might come down to the kind of runner you are, who you go for, or between these kind of watches. Like the Garmin probably suits me better as a kind of road runner with a fixed training plan, training for a marathon. I want structured workouts. I like the training analysis that Garmin does in terms of breaking it down uh, in kind of aerobic, anaerobic, that kind of thing. It all works really well for me. If you're someone who wants much more advanced uh, kind of recovery analysis and that kind of thing, which I don't fuss, I'm not fussed about. Like I say, I have a coach setting my plan. I'm not really looking at that kind of thing. And that ultra long battery life mode you can use, then the Polar Vantage V2 will probably suit you better. And as well, the design being a bit bulkier and bigger will, um, will I think a lot of people will like that. Whereas some people will obviously much prefer the very small and light 745 if you have got kind of thinner wrists. Um, uh, but I'm sure you guys have taken that as well. Quickly, we should say like, the 945 and the Phoenix 6 are more expensive than the uh, than the uh, V2. You might be able to find the 945 at a similar price. And there, the upgrade you're going to get really is uh, the the maps on the watch, um, the full color maps that you know I think are really useful. You're also getting music um, in terms of being able to store music and link up to streaming services like Spotify, a few other cool features, and the very long battery life on some models of the Phoenix and the uh, and the 945 has kind of 36 hours of GPS and a very long real world use. But yeah, they're a little bit pricier, but I think some of them are coming down now in price towards the 450 mark if you're looking in sales. Okay, well, there you have it. That is our review of the Polar Vantage V2. We took some time to get it to you, but that's because we like to put these things through a lot of thorough testing. We don't rush it here on the Run Testers. Uh, it's worth saying that we have videos for things like the Grit X, for the, the Garmin 4 Runner 745 on the Channel 2. Have a look for those if you want to compare some of those watches and see if, you, if the V2 should be for you. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe, otherwise Mike will get very, very angry. And we hope to see you again soon on the Run Testers for more of the same. Thanks for watching, guys.